Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar, where we sit down and talk with interesting professional guitar players, uncover their stories, and discover what makes them tick. If you love guitar, music, and the backstory of people's lives, stick around. You're in the right place. This episode of Everyone Loves Guitar is brought to you by Taylor Guitars and their new Grand Pacific Round Shoulder Dreadnought. Powered by Taylor's Breakthrough V-Class Bracing System, the Grand Pacific gives you a warm season sound with clear low-end power and notes that are stronger, longer sustaining, and more in tune with each other all the way up the fretboard. Make sure you check it out online at taylorguitars.com, then go out and play one today. That's the new Grand Pacific at taylorguitars.com. Did you know if your instrument or any of your gear is damaged, broken, or stolen outside your home, your homeowner's insurance policy will not cover any of it? That's right. Homeowner's insurance only pays if something happens inside your home. But Music Pro Insurance insures all your music gear, no matter where it is, anywhere in the world, even when you check it in as baggage on an airline. Here, let me give you some examples. Let's say you're in a car accident and your equipment is damaged, you're covered. Your kid pours apple juice into your amplifier, covered. Someone spills beer all over your pedal board at a gig somewhere across the world, boom, you're covered. Any kind of theft or accidental damage is covered, even water damage from hurricanes and breakage from earthquakes. But here's what makes Music Pro really different. They're not going to argue with you over the value of your instrument or make you run around looking for receipts when it comes time to paying your claim. They know exactly why your vintage instrument is worth 10 times more than a new one. Plus, all claims are typically paid and fully settled in 24 to 48 hours. So if your equipment is not insured properly, go to musicproinsurance.com, hit standard, then enter your information and get a free gear protection estimate. Don't be that player who ignores this, and then next month when something happens, you're wondering why you didn't take 10 minutes to do this properly. Make sure you go to musicproinsurance.com, enter your information, and get a free gear protection estimate. If something happens, you will be thanking me. Trust me on this, musicproinsurance.com. The Be Fulfilled Journal helps you be more honest with yourself and with others and be more open to handling things you've avoided dealing with for years. It's a 12-week online and journal program that helps you identify and eliminate things you do that are causing you stress and live in more gratitude and joy. It was actually developed by a long-term friend of mine who got sober in 2008, and he's put together a great deal just for my listeners. You get the 300-page hardcover journal and access to the 12-week video program online, plus free shipping, plus membership in a private Facebook support group with others going through the program, plus a five-day mini course showing you how to let go of stuff that's draining your energy, plus a 30-day 100% money-back guarantee. To start your journey and get all the bonuses, go to BeFulfilledJournal.com forward slash ELG. That's BeFulfilledJournal.com forward slash ELG. For information about advertising on Everyone Loves Guitar, including information on geographically targeted ads, go to EveryoneLovesGuitar.com forward slash advertise. That's EveryoneLovesGuitar.com forward slash advertise. Hey, this is Craig, and I just want to talk to you about something serious for a moment before we start today's episode. In 2018, at the very beginning of the year in January, I had interviewed Frank Sidoris. Frank was and still is Slash's guitar player. He's a lovely guy, really cool, and just a tremendous guitar player. And I actually had a lot of fun with Frank, and he's one of those guys we've stayed in touch throughout this time. And last week, I read some really unfortunate news on his social media channels that his girlfriend has cervical cancer. And I don't know if you have had a family member or had had cancer impact your life or your family's life or a friend's life, but I have. And it's a terribly devastating disease in every single way and and the sense of powerlessness that you feel when a loved one has cancer is really devastating anyway frank's girlfriend i do not believe has any kind of medical insurance he is running a gofundme campaign and i just wanted to tell you about the campaign if you are inclined to go 
uh, donate, make a donation. I know Frank and his girlfriend would appreciate it. And I just wanted to give you the location of where you could find that campaign. The best thing to do is go to Frank's socials and his Instagram and Twitter is both at Frank Sidoris and his name is Frank, F-R-A-N-K-S-I-D-O-R-I-S. And you can also find it on his Facebook page, which is facebook.com forward slash Frank Sidoris. Again, F-R-A-N-K-S-I-D-O-R-I-S. Any little bit you're willing to give will help those guys out. And I'm just going to run this message for this week to help Frank and his uh, family out. And uh, whether you've been impacted by cancer or not, I certainly thank you for listening to this. And I uh, wish you nothing but good health. So now let's get on with the show. Hey, everybody. This is Craig Garber. Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar. I've got a great guest today with Brian Whalen uh, out of L.A. And um, I think his story is going to be really interesting to everybody because he's a great example of a guy who is a successful sideman and broke off from a very successful gig because he wanted to do his own thing and be the artist. And I think he'll be really candid in talking about what that's like and and the uh, the highs and lows of that. So with that said, I want to welcome Brian Whalen to the show. Uh, he's a singer-songwriter, multi-instrumentalist. He spent four years as Dwight Yoakam's utility man, and he went solo in 2015. He just released his second LP called Sugarland, and he's working on a third, hopefully be out this year. He majored in music. He also played uh, for four or five years for an indie rock band called is it Broken. I'm sorry. Oh, it's called The Broken West. The Broken West. That's a such an indie rock band name. The Broken oh, yeah. West. Yeah, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> indie rock band for sure. The Broken West. Um, he majored in music at USC, plays almost anything with keys or strings, including steel guitar, accordion, and piano. And I just want to give a shout out and say thank you to Ted Russell Camp for connecting Brian and I. Dude, thanks so much for coming on the show, man. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Um, we talked earlier, you worked with Dwight, Dwight Yoakam, for four years as his utility player. I was curious how you got that gig in the first place and what were some of the takeaways that you got out of that experience? Yeah. Um, so that gig, uh, it, if I go back to the very beginning, I, there was there's a bar in Los Angeles and Culver, in Culver City neighborhood called the Cinema Bar. And when I was about 21, I started going there a lot. And there was a lot of great roots music being played there by people who lived in L.A. You know, and L.A. has a country music and a roots music history that goes back to it goes back a long way. It's probably probably the early 60s um, when a lot of the Bakersfield artists started recording in uh, Hollywood in the 50s and 60s. Um, and it's come down and, you know, people think of Texas and Nashville as being the centers, but LA has a lot of that kind of music as well. And I fell in with a group of guys, including Mike Stinson, uh, Tony Gilkison, Randy Weeks. Um, they were, they were all singers and songwriters and musicians, um, in that scene. And they had a, a guy named Josh Grange, who was the bass player for them at that time. And I was a really young kid. And over the years, I, befriended these guys and towards the end of my 20s josh grange uh tried to hook me up with his overflow so when he was too busy with his gigs he would try to get me on the gigs and you know he recommended me for a couple of things you know ryan adams and jack white and some kind of bigger artists and none of that ever worked out and then finally one day he called me and goes hey you know i've been with dwight for five six years and i'm just too busy now and i'm gonna go do the you know, the Dixie Chicks and Katie Lang and these other gigs. And do you want the gig? Do you want to take the gig? Wow. And I said, absolutely. And so what I did was I went down to Dwight's office in Hollywood and met him and talked to him for about an hour. And, uh, and then that was it. You know, he asked if I played these instruments. Um, you know, I didn't play steel guitar at the time. And he asked me if I wanted to go get one and try to figure it out. And I said, sure, Dwight. And that's how I became a steel guitar player, which I'm, you know, not super good at, but that's, that's the story. That's how it came about. Um, and then, uh, so that's how I got the gig and I was there for four or five years and played on a couple of his albums, two or three of his albums and uh, went all over the world with him and had a great time. 
Um, was the second part of the question, what are, what are my takeaways from that? Yeah, what, like, what did you get anything out of that experience professionally, yeah. musically, entertainment-wise? Well, you know, the most important thing that I got out of it was that um, it just ingrained in me that, that I, I was not out of my depth and that I could do this. That's and it was what I was, really important, man. You know, it's just what I was supposed to be doing, and, and I haven't ever kind of doubted since then um, that I'm in the right place. You know, until you have a gig like that, you can always kind of wonder, you know, if you should be. I mean, in fact, in, in 2009, you know, the band, the indie rock band I was in had broken up, and I was kind of uh, drifting. And, there, and I was asking myself frequently if – I needed to make a, you know, contemplate a career change because I was really broke and I hadn't had any good, you know, all I had done was, was van tours and, and bar gigs and club gigs. And I was just wondering if this was really going to be for me. Uh, and so, you know, a gig like that does, does wonders for your kind of confidence and your sense of purpose and your sense of place. So that was the big thing that I took from it. You know, it was a really good gig, you know, in LA, especially Dwight is kind of like, big deal yeah. so uh it's definitely it definitely helped open some doors and, and like i said to you a minute ago it's you know it helps to get work because people know that if you did that gig they kind of know you know you can skip a few steps because yeah. you, people know that you went to boot camp and that you know how to do a real gig a quote-unquote real gig yeah well your playing isn't an issue your ability to get along is not an issue yeah, you know what I mean. So it, yeah. it just it just lets you it just lets people know that you're for real. I think that that's probably the best thing um, that that came from it for me. And and you know, and I also just have a million just amazing stories I and mean, just, just one liners and stuff from Dwight. I mean, Dwight's a very funny, very charismatic guy, and you know, just getting to share space with him was great. You know, it was. It was great to see how he writes songs, how he works in a studio, how he runs a gig, how he how he deals with um, engineers, promoters, uh, guitar techs, like on and on and on. It was just it was kind of like going and getting like a master's degree in rock and roll where you can watch somebody do all these different parts of the job. And, um, you know, I mean, that's like it was uh, it's it's like when I went solo. I would go out and I basically in a lot of ways had to start over because I was playing in big places and now I'm playing in small places again. But it's like, it gave me a lot of perspective. You know what I mean? Where yeah. I would be, I would, I would be having some kind of problem or have some kind of issue. And then all of a sudden I would remember Dwight having that kind of issue. You know what I mean? And at sure. the time I would like wonder, you know, what's, you know, what's Dwight so mad about? You know what I mean? And then all of a sudden it was me and I was like, Oh, I see. I see Interesting. Why. Yeah. And it's like that. I had a lot of moments where that just came slamming into focus. Um, and it really, it really uh, helped in terms of just my perspective. You know what I mean? Any funny Dwight stories you could share? <laughs> There's not, not too many I can share. I will tell you, the, <laughs> uh, I will tell you some of, you know, cause this is, this is, this is good though. This is kind of like, a really good piece of advice um, that I got from him because, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I'm maybe not always the most like outgoing person, especially with uh, strangers. And I just remember one night, you know, we were on the bus and we were parked out in front of the venue and there were these people outside the bus that were just like knocking on the doors and the windows of the bus because they wanted him to come out and sign some <laughs> stuff for him. You know what I mean? And I, uh, you know, we were kind of having a laugh and I said, you know, I don't know. I don't know how you do it, you know, like every day like this. And, uh, you know, I mean, it was kind of in jest, but it was also kind of real. And I asked that question and he goes, well, he goes, you know, he goes, you're in an awful lot of trouble when they stop asking. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, and it's just, it's just one of those things where it's like it's very easy to, you know, get annoyed by the kind of day to day of having a career where it's, it's your name on it. You know what I mean? There's just a lot of stuff to take care of. There's a lot of people and groups of people that you, 
that you have to contend with. You've got to make one, everybody happy. Yeah, and you gotta, and you really do kind of, you, you kind of are expected to make everybody happy, which sure. is impossible, right? Yes, a hundred percent. Yeah, and, and you so, can't make your spouse happy twenty four seven. So it's ridiculous. Well, to, yeah, you know, your kind of fan but, base yeah. or your producers, your managers, your agents. Like, there's just there's a lot there's a lot of stuff up in the air to kind of keep track of, and I'll always remember that, you know, because it's something, you know, it's something that you have to kind of. You, I, I at least have to remind myself of that because, you know, a lot of the kind of a lot of the times when you meet like fans, it's not under like ideal circumstances. It's like maybe you've already worked like you're exhausted you've yeah, traveled all day and then done the show. And now it's like, oh, cool. Now I get to like relax. And it's like, actually, no, no. Nope. You, <laughs> you know what I mean? And it was just a really important lesson because it just goes. It's like, you know, you don't it's never over. You're never, you're never like off. You know what I mean? And it's like, and when people stop caring about your music and stop wanting you to sign shit and stop wanting more and more from you, you know, it's, it's going to be pretty tough for you. Cause what are you going to, you know, you're not going to, you're not yeah. going to be able to sell any tickets. You know what I mean? Uh, so now that you're a solo artist, right? How have you, um, have you gotten better at, or have you found a way to become more comfortable with strangers and, you know, in interacting with them in a way that's positive without like stressing out? Right. Uh, yeah, I've gotten better at that. And that takes, that just takes practice. Um, you know, I mean, it's just, it's just like a mental exercise for me that there's a lot of parts of this, you know, we were talking about Facebook earlier and it's like trying to stay on top of like posting about, uh, you know, my music or myself or whatever, when it's like, if I had my druthers, I probably would never really post anything. Right. You know? And so it's just one of these things where I kind of have had to get better at it because it's just part of the, it's just part of the job. Yeah. It's part of the landscape now. You have to. And, and like you just said, you know, keeping, keeping those kind of interactions with, um, with people positive, whether yeah. it's a, a fan or so, you know, someone who bought a ticket or, uh, a house sound guy, house merch guy, the promoter, you know, certain, you know, band members, personnel, that's always changing. And it's like trying to keep all of those interactions and relationships positive. Um, you know, it definitely, it definitely takes work. And, um, you know, one thing, and I was, I was just talking about this the other day. It's like, uh, I feel like I'm kind of like pretty nice, and I'm pretty nice and I'm pretty nice. And then I'll hit a point and I'll just fucking scream and yell. <laughs> but I, and I've seen other guys, other guys that I work for kind of do that same thing. And, you know, it's interesting because it's, it only takes about half a second of that for the kind of people and like the online community to start being like, this is a difficult artist. You know what I mean? And I've seen this happen with Dwight. I've seen this happen with other people. And it's like, I don't think that this artist is that difficult. Like, no, but I think, people don't know. People don't spend the time and invest the time to figure it out. It's just the guy came to town and there's a show that has his name on it. And there's all these people involved in the show who like didn't do their jobs. And so now they're getting yelled at. And it's kind of like, you know, in my experience, it's, it usually helps because like next time you come back, whoever you like yelled at has now like done extra work to make sure you're going to be happy. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? And so yeah. I kind of like to, I don't like to do that all the time, but it's definitely, uh, it's just an interesting kind of a thing where it's like, I try to keep it positive and just, you know, all, all the time. And then it's like, unless someone is kind of like not doing their job or something is not right. Cause especially like for my like quote unquote solo tour, solo career, it's like, I mean, I pay for everything, mm -hmm. you pay for everything yourself. And then you travel a long way to get there. And it's like, if something's not right, you know, that's not okay. No, you know it's I mean? not okay. Yeah. There was too much that was kind of sacrificed and, and given up. And, and so it's kind of like, uh, that's kind of how I kind of, I deal with it is I guess it kind of, uh, it's mostly positive. Uh, and then I kind of pick my moments to be critical or, or negative. You know what I mean? You know, I, I don't know if this will matter or help or anything. My, 
regular gig is I run a marketing company and I've written ad copy in like 110 industries over the last 20 years. And a guy told me early on, a guy who mentored me, he's one of the very few business mentors I had, probably the only one actually. And he said to me, he said, you know that there's like a quote from this old writer Thoreau and it says, most men lead lives of quiet consternation and die with the song still in them. And he said, Craig, every day, that's your audience. These are people who have, a, you know, not necessarily a black cloud over their head, but there's not a lot of sunshine in there. So he said, you really want to be the ray of sunshine in people's lives and a, the ray of optimism. And if you can do that, he said, you'll always, people will always pretty much have open arms with you. And I thought about that logically, and I wasn't really that guy, that ray of fucking sunshine 20 years ago. I got to be honest with you. And, um, but I said, man, that, that really makes a lot of sense. And I, I've tried to do that and I'm certainly not perfect at it, but it, it has, I've, it has proven you know, like I try not to make my problems somebody else's problems, you know, mm -hmm. and it's really yeah. worked out pretty well. You know, I mean, people are, you know, when you are always, you know, I'm not like uh, the happy home, you know, Pollyanna about things, you know, I'm pretty realistic, but, you know, I just try not to make my issues somebody else's and I, I tr try to keep it positive and people are pretty open to that. So I think there's something to be said about that, you know. Yeah, no, and I agree with you. And I, you know, I have a long a long way to go before anyone would describe me as a ray of sunshine. <laughs> well, 20 uh, years ago, I, I was your age. <laughs> but, but, you know, 20 years, you know, 10, yeah. 20 years from now, I hope to be, kind of, I hope be, to be closer to that. Dude, really you'll, be, you'll be totally fine. You will. Honestly, it's a very <laughs> weird thing that happens because you get to a point, you're like, you know, it, it takes a lot of work to be an asshole. I'm not saying you're an asshole, but I was. And I was like, it takes a lot of work to be an asshole. This is really just not a good return on this energy. So <laughs> let me, let me, I got to rethink this whole asshole thing, you know? So anyway, yeah. not to get off topic, but it was, that's, oh, you, you, you'll be, you'll be fine, man. Totally. Um, so then you, t okay. So, um, when you left Dwight, I was telling you before, and I think that's a really, bold and daring move and and i have all the respect in the world for you um for doing that and making that choice i think there are a lot of people probably listening to that that have that either have experiences or would like to experience this and maybe something's holding them back so if you could share maybe what what was going through your mind like what made you pull the trigger um i think you'll be actually a ray of sunshine for a lot of people that would like to do the same thing but for some reason they're not Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's uh, it's not necessarily something that I would recommend. You know what I mean? It's, hmm. it's something that I felt strongly, you know, that I wanted to do. Um, and I, I know this is a, like kind of, you know, without getting into like too many of the specifics, I really just felt like it was time. Yeah. You know, I was, I was trying to have a, a solo career and a sideman career at this, you know, a career working for Dwight and then put out my own records at the same time. And there just wasn't really enough time. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I had the money to pay, you know, my first record came out, I hired radio and, and, uh, you know, publicist and I hired an artist and we got it, you know, we, we made this record and we did it for real. And then there was no time to go out and promote it at all. So I had boxes of albums that I didn't really have a great way to sell. You know, I had press coming out in towns that I didn't have time to go to. Oh my God. It's like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so it's no one's fault. It's no, just, it's how shit shakes out sometimes. Yeah. And I just kind of learned that I had to kind of, I had to, I was going to have to pick one. Yeah. So I was working on the second record. And then when it came time to release it, I was like, all right, this is the moment. You know, I'd been I'd been with Dwight a long time, and you know, uh, you know, one thing that I really learned is like, you know, everyone everyone kind of thinks that they know everything. Everyone kind of thinks that they're a record producer, or they or they could go be a front man, or they could start their own marketing company, or whatever. Yeah. And um, it's not as easy as it as it as you think it is. Nothing you know, ever is, man. You know, and so I would be, I would say, you know, well, wh I wonder why Dwight is doing this or that, right? 
and uh, and I got tired of wondering about those things and just and said, you know what? Like, I'm going to stop second guessing this guy who's had this amazing career <laughs> and just go and go do it myself. And it's like I learned a, an awful lot in a hurry. Yeah. And uh, and it was just one of those things where I wanted to kind of put my money where my mouth was and go have that experience. And I, I still, you know, the jury is still out uh, as to whether it was the right choice. Yeah. You know, I, I it was a really good gig. It, it um, you know, and I kind of left a lot on the table there. But I really wanted to go. I really wanted to go have this experience and wanted to just. I wanted to have more. Uh, more different kinds of experiences. As well, I think it's the right. It's, just, it's no doubt it was the right choice. It's just a question of how does this, how does this end? Yeah, sure. You know, I mean, it's the right choice because if you if you didn't do it, you'd have been miserable your whole life thinking. Yeah, so okay. it's totally the right. So, yeah, no, no it's the right I, choice. There are some guys who who stay on on and not just that gig, but all kinds of gigs. You know, yeah. there's, there's guys who stay too long uh, because you know usually just because of the money. Or because of the kind of prestige that comes from a, a certain gig, um, you know. And it's, there's just nothing worse than staying too long and and being um, you doing a, a gig you're unhappy with, because you know, at the end of the day, you're getting you're getting paid to play music, which right. hardly anyone who plays music gets to really go gets to experience. And so. Uh, that's that's just kind of uh, and then like you say you know our job is kind of to be a ray of sunshine uh, towards you know for people who you know there's a lot of guys out there who love playing guitar and they are not able to play guitar for a living they have another that's, job that they have to do they have they have kids they have mortgages and it's like I I really do take that to heart what you, what you were kind of alluding to mm -hmm. earlier it's like I I want to give them something good. I want to, you know, because they they like music and they like like the idea of guys that are out there making it happen. Yeah, totally. So you one of those guys, and I just, you know, want to do a good job, and I wanted to try some other stuff. So I don't know exactly how it ends. But Nobody there's, does. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of music out there to to be a part of, you know, and so that was really that was really a you know the end, the beginning, and the end of. Uh, of why that went down the way it did. There was just more to do, you know, man, I totally respect you and, and uh, anything I could do to, to help you out. I'm, I'm, I'm game and I'm, I'm really happy for you that you did that. Uh, what'd you do? You went to USC and you got a degree in music. What did you do straight out of college? Straight out of college. I started a band with some guy. I joined a band and it was called the smooth pursuit. And it was a super duper loud, <laughs> Uh, like garage rock and roll band a la uh, My Morning Jacket or uh, The White Stripes or Kings of Leon, which at, which at the time, no one remembers this, but their first album, Youth and Young Manhood, was like a Roots rock record. Oh, I didn't know that. That's interesting. Yeah, it was, it was like it sounded like, uh, you know, early 70s Rolling Stones. Dude, you have very good band names, The Smooth Pursuit, The Broken oh West. These are... <laughs> Smooth Pursuit was a terrible band name. It was. It was oh, I know, like it. I think it's cool, man. Uh, um, I think it's it's very like garage rock '60s sure. sounding. You know? Well, Smooth Pursuit is what the police are testing when they if they pull you over and are testing you for a DUI when they shine the light in your eye and ask you to follow the light. They are in fact testing your Smooth Pursuit. Oh, you that's know? that's so even we'll better now, man. That's what. Well, no, and that and that definitely fit with uh, yeah. with the kind of ethos of the band at the time. <laughs> Very cool. Very cool. I like this when there's a story behind something. That's cool, man. Oh yeah, no, we had some stories, and so that was the first. So we we had a couple cars, and that was the first uh, U.S. touring that I ever did. And uh, and I basically just you know I was trying to juggle that with uh, you know day jobs so I could pay the rent sure. and. Uh, and that kind of, you know, I was in that band for probably two or three years. It started when I was still in college and carried over to maybe uh, 2005. And and you were playing bass or guitar there? I was playing guitar and was the lead singer and uh, co-wrote the music with the other guitar player. And and then you joined the Broken West from that, after that? Yeah, and the, the Broken West uh, came a couple of years, maybe in, in 2006, 
Uh, and that's when I moved. I moved from the west side of Los Angeles to the east side, where mm. I've been ever since. And that that coincided with joining the Broken West. Is that a big? Is that like far? I, I don't know LA at all. Is that like? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's it's just kind of the joke out here where it's like you don't. It's people don't really cross town that much. You know oh, really? I mean? Yeah, you stay on your side. Really? Yeah. You kind of stay on your side, you know, because a lot of people have a, a grueling commute for work mm. where, where they're going for work. And so sure. when they get home, they kind of stay in their area. They're not leaving. <laughs> on nights and weekends, they just kind of stay where they, where they are, which I certainly did, you know, when I lived on the, well, on the West side, I hung out there a lot more, Yeah, you know? And, um, but anyway, so I made that move and joined that band. And, uh, and then that was the next kind of four or five year, uh, chapter of my life where I, there were other bands that I played with and, and other connections that got made, including the ones that led me to, to Dwight. But, you know, I was kind of in the indie rock world for a little while. You know what I mean? Like yeah. at that time, you know, we all wanted to kind of sound like the band Spoon uh, or, you know, I, I know Arcade Fire was a, was a big one at that mm-hmm. time, New Pornographers. And so that was the kind of world that I was in. Um, but, you know, that was always a, a – it was always a tricky thing for me because I was the bass player in that band and like the harmony singer, but I was not, you know, the other two guys, the other, the two guitar players, you know, one of them was the lead singer and they wrote all the material and they kind of made all the band decisions and and all of that stuff. So it was their band pretty much. So it was kind of their band. It was a band, but it's like all bands have a leader and and a hierarchy, you know? Um, and so, and that one just kind of – that band just kind of came to an end the way a lot of bands do. It's like right about the time where you've paid off your debts. <laughs> and, uh, Guys, and this you, is just not working. <laughs> and, and, you know, well, you've been to every town in America like six times. Yeah, yeah. It's like the first two times no one goes. And then the second two times there's like 15 to 30 people. And then you finally start getting like 75 to 100 people in – Minneapolis, Chicago, Chapel Hill, Austin, Seattle, Portland. Like you finally start yeah. to get action. And, uh, and then the two songwriters decided they didn't, you know, they didn't want to do it together anymore Wow. for whatever reason. And so the band just broke up and we'd been through at that point, we were on our second drummer. We were on our third or fourth keyboard player. You know, it was just, it had, it had been a ton of work. Hmm. And there's a lot of stuff, you know, that went on in that band that I probably do not even know. Right, because right. There, because there's these other guy, the other two guys were kind of running the band. And I was like, I mean, the most kind of assholey and kind of party animal that I ever have been. <laughs> kind of when I was in that band, I spent, uh, unfortunately, I spent a lot of that time just being completely partied out. And, uh, you know, but that's the time probably, to do that, man. that much fun to like hang out with. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. 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 When that, when that broke up, I just think everyone was probably tired of it. Um, and so that ended. And, and like I was saying earlier, you know, I was kind of, uh, I was kind of drifting there for about a year when that ended, uh, and just kind of, I was at the end of my twenties, um, you know, a lot of my relationships had ended, you know, the, the woman I'd been with for five, six, you know, almost all my twenties was at, now gone out of the picture. Um, the band that I'd been with for five or six years was out of the picture. None of those guys wanted to talk to me either. Oh, so you it was know, bleak. It was pretty bleak. You know, I was really uh-huh. broke. You know what I mean? Like I didn't have any debt, but I also didn't have any money Yeah, because you know, we'd made just enough to kind of clear our debts and everything. Um, but it was a bleak time for sure. And that was when I, you know, in fact, the song, you know, the, the track Decider is actually kind of about that. From the, to, the, the, the title track from their first record. Yeah. yeah. Cause I mean, it was kind of, I was, I was trying to decide if I wanted to uh, keep doing this, you know what I mean? To stay on the treadmill of the music business. You what, know what, I mean? what was the trigger to stay in? Getting hired by Dwight Yoakam. Yeah. Okay. There you go. <laughs> I mean, you know what I mean? It was yeah. like, he, he asked me to join this band and it was such a level up for me that I had to really scramble to learn how to do it. I mean, I had to go get a pedal steel and start just practicing like four or five hours a day so that I could go do these gigs and, um, and just learn how to do it. I had to learn 50, you know, 60 yeah. songs or whatever. I had to just, 
get my wardrobe together, get my act together, get everything you know all lined up. And so all of a sudden, I had a, a purpose. Right, right. And there wasn't any time to be, uh, you know, broke and depressed and and wondering what I was going to do. Thank you know goodness, I, man. Yeah, no, I mean that's what I mean. It's like yeah. we're making fun of people's using the hashtag blessed, but I I got really, <laughs> I got really lucky. Yeah. Uh, you know what I mean? Yeah, and I just it totally was, it was the right thing for me to do at the right time. You know, I was still in my 20s, so I was the youngest person working for Dwight by a decade or more. Mm, right, right. And, you know, so I just, you know, and it's like most people, if they're looking for someone to come play pedal steel and like you don't know how to play pedal steel. They generally, they yeah. <laughs> they, generally they, just, they generally don't hire you. Yeah. But like it was an auxiliary position. You know, I'm a singer, a guitar player, a keyboard player, so I can handle the other stuff. But, you know, Dwight kind of, I think that, you know, his, the, the kind of circus ringleader aspect of his mentality and his camp is kind of evident in that choice to hire a non steel guitar player to play steel guitar. Yeah. yeah. Because I probably thought that that was chaotic and funny and interesting. And, you know, I mean, I was for at least the first year and, and more than that, I was like terrified. Every time I went on stage to play steel, I was really terrified. You know, my, I would be sweating and my legs would be shaking and trying to play this instrument. And it's like, I think Dwight probably thought it was hilarious. Right. I, I don't, right. I wouldn't want to speak for him, but I don't, I mean, he could have easily got someone else, you know what I mean? But I just got lucky to be there and, and get to have that experience. It was, it was a really lucky thing. A lot of young guys are playing pedal steel now. It's been like a resurgence in pedal steel. Right. They're sure they're, they're has. really has, but and, it's, a really, and, it's a really hard instrument to play. Um, incredibly and, hard. And I think it's really a lifelong, you know, a lot of guys who learn how to play, including me and, and probably a lot of the guys you're talking about, you know, they're, they're guitar players Yes. and they, and they get a steal so they can, you know, be more versatile and get more gigs and maybe they you know, really like country music or whatever. But the guys who are really good are guys who really only play steel and they've made it pretty much their life's work. I've interviewed some of those guys too out of Nashville, like Russ Paul. Um, oh yeah. Uh, just a few guys that for the most part only play steel of names of which and there's are more a out bit there. of a brain fart, but yeah, there's, there's a, a half dozen guys here in LA who are kind of a list guys or maybe even less than that. And, and, you know, um, Nashville has a lot. more. Oh yeah. Yeah. Cause of the and country Nashville thing. and Texas have, have a lot more guys, but there's a few out here that are really good. Um, what are you working on now that you're excited about? Well, I'm doing my third record right now. So, and I'm kind of, I'm kind of in the final stage as most of the stuff is, is kind of in the, in the mix stage right now. So I should have that out by the, you know, sometime this year. I don't have any kind of a plan for it. Um, does I'm not signed to a label or anything like that. So does that have a title yet? I don't have a title. No, I don't have a title. Um, the guy, uh, who has been playing drums in my band for about four or five years is named Luke Adams. And he uh, is the is producing it with me. Oh, cool! And we're doing it at his studio, and it sounds. I mean, I'm pretty excited about it. It does not. Uh, it's not really as rootsy or uh, in the kind of Americana um, genre as I have been in the past. What it's is it a, more of? Well, it's like I think the songs are really strong. There's a lot of co-writes on there. Um, so in that sense, I think it's like kind of pop, but the production has leaned uh, toward just more of a modern kind of production feel as opposed to, uh, you know, something that sounds like a alt country or a roots rock record or something, which the other two very much do, I think. We're more Americana. This, 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 I think, is more into a pop world and, and more into like some a lot of modern production, which is Luke. You know, Luke is kind of a modern sounding and you know producer and mixer you know so did you and i'm glad about that i, I want to have something that's a little you know getting away from the cowboy hats and the pedal steel and the, and that kind of world you know what i mean yeah i was going to ask you are you are you happy that you you got you, you know one thing i've learned from interviewing so many people is it's got to be a when it comes to creativity it's got to be authentic man it's really hard to you know, fake stuff as a musician. Yeah. 
it's it, yeah I, it's uh you know like i said a lot of these songs are um co-writes you know what i mean it's yes. like my 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 last two records you know i had those co-writes on there and there are some covers and stuff but a lot of it is just me you yeah. know they just written music and lyrics by me and so this has been kind of cool to just get involved with some other people um i've done a lot of co-writing uh, in the last year or two. And, um, you know, it's just one of those things where it's like blind dates. A lot of the time, it's like, sometimes you just don't get anything out of it. (laughs) You know what I mean? You you sit there with someone for three hours and try to write a song and you get like nothing. And that's happened a bunch of times. Um, but every once in a while you sit there for three hours with someone and you end up with a really cool song. Right, Right. And there isn't really a way, uh, to really know. There's no vetting process for that. Yeah, no, I mean, there's there's some vetting, you know. It's like I I have a publishing deal, and so the the guys at my publishing company okay. try to set me up with writers in Nashville or in L.A. Mm. Um, occasionally, I mean, not all the time, but that's where some of it comes from. Sure. And then a lot of it is people, you know, that happens a lot where you'll be out and someone will be like, "Hey, we should get together and write sometime." And so in that case, the vetting takes place mostly just in my mind and yeah. in their mind. I yeah. guess. And you just kind of, uh, you know, try to get something done. And there's, you know, some people where it's like, I, you know, I don't really want to write with them. And then I do and we get something. And there's others where I'm real psyched to write with them and we don't get anything. I mean, it's just, it's like any, it really can yeah. go a number of different ways. Um, and do you ever so get I've, set up with somebody and you just like, like before you even walk in the room, I wouldn't think this happened, but there's just like, you're almost like allergic to them. <laughs> that would oh. be, <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's probably not likely to happen. No. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think having it go really well or really poorly, you know, really extreme in either direction yeah. is, is pretty rare. Yeah. I think a lot of the time it's, it's just close to the kind of middle of the road. Um, and I, you know, I haven't ever had anybody where I felt like I was allergic to them. Yeah. Uh, but I've definitely had a song where within like half hour or 45 minutes, I don't like the song and I know that I'm never going to use the song. Uh, but at that point, especially if it's a stranger, you kind of have to like finish the song. <laughs> Dude, listen, we're done. <laughs> yeah, and so that's not, that's go, not a horrible experience. Go get but, lunch. Yeah, but it's got to be frustrating as hell. Like yeah. if you wrote, wrote something, you're like, it's not bad, but I would never play it. But at the same time, then again, you could have the challenge of saying, you know what, let me go back and see if I could change the, the something about it. Because right. if we got this asset, can we put sure. it to work? So yeah, that, yeah. That I, I think, I think that's cool a really too. good point. Yeah. I mean, I just, I definitely, uh, I try to not always listen to, you know how people tell you to like, listen to your gut. I think a lot of the times with, with creative stuff. Yeah, I, I agree with you. It's like, it, it, I think that's good advice for the most part, but sometimes, I mean, I've been wrong a bunch of times. Yeah. I mean, Luke yeah. and I, you know, so I do these like co-writes, right? I bring the song into Luke and we start working on it. We work on it for a day or two. And then, you know, since we're both working other jobs all the time, we get together real sporadically. Yeah. And so now we've been working on this stuff for like almost two years or maybe more. And there's like all this material and I can't even remember some of it, you know, cause we'll have, we'll have big gaps, you know, between, you know, between our, our sessions sometimes. And so, you know, I, a few months ago I was like, okay, you know what, let's take a day and let's listen to all the stuff that we have. You sure. Know? And so we start listening to it and there's like a song in there. There's one song in particular that I'm thinking of where I was just, the track sounded so good. Like we, we had just been going at like this kind of frenetic pace and like kind of like by accident got like this really good track with really cool. There's like a really cool drum sound. And I, you know, I had to like sing it again, but I remember that I wasn't even sure like if I liked the song. Right. When you're cranking stuff out, that happens, right. man, because you, you're just in that mode of, of content, 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 content. And yeah. I, I've done that in uh, not music, but in other stuff, you know, and I yeah. know exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And you go back and look at it, man, it's not bad. Yeah. No, and that's, and that's, you know, just having the, some time pass and yeah. the you know, context being different or whatever it is. It's like, 
sitting there listening to the songs and I'm like, wow, it's like I have like more. It's like the, the song that I thought was like the strongest is not. Yeah. You yeah. Know, the song I thought was the weakest is not. It's like, you know, they tell you to trust your gut, but it's like I don't for, for me, it's not always the best way. I think sometimes that stuff takes a little bit of time. Whereas if I if I just went into the studio, tracked a bunch of shit and then like released it and the whole thing happened in three months. <laughs> it might be a real different record from one that takes two years to do that same process, well, know, which I, which is interesting to me. Plus I think when you, you, I think when you, if you're trusting your gut, you're, you you got to be on. And if you're in a mode of crank, 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 work, 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 you're, that's not a gut, uh, you know, then you're going to all of a sudden switch your gut on. It doesn't, like yeah. for me anyway, it doesn't work like that. You know, yeah. I gotta gotta consider. I gotta be present w- when I'm considering something that's like a gut related decision. And sometimes when you're working, you're on autopilot. I, I am anyway. It's just like, you know. Well, I think you're right though. I, I, blazing it, through shit. Yeah, yeah. It's like it's like autopilot. It's 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 a very different part of your brain that, that's being used in those two different kinds of, of processes. So. Yeah. Well, man, I, I'm looking forward to your record coming out. So no name yet. Um. Everyone loves guitar. Is that a good name, no? Yeah. That, that is, I mean, if, you, just, if there's no just, copyright issue, I, I actually think it's what you think. Um, just messing with you, man. Well, I'm looking forward to that coming out, and I'm excited for you, man. I'm looking forward to, to listening to it. Um, where are you originally from? Are you, like, are you from L.A.? No, I'm, I'm originally from Seattle, Washington. Oh, cool. And I, uh, we, uh, you know, we moved around a little bit. Um. But I've been on the West Coast my whole life. You know, my uh, my parents moved when, when I was about 13. We moved down to the Bay Area, to San mm-hmm. Jose. And I went to high school there. And then when I was 18, I moved to L.A. And I've been in L.A. almost 20 years. Gotcha. Uh, I got to tell you, man, I was in Seattle um, probably 10, 10 years ago or so. Um, we drove, I think, from Boise to Seattle. First time ever out in the Pacific Northwest. That's a nice drive. My God. I mean, I have never had, like, it was like a religious, exp- and I'm not a religious person at all, but it was like a religious experience going on that drive. It is majestic out there, man. I mean, it's yeah. it's it's absolutely, you know, I'm in, I'm grew up in New York City and I live in Florida. Well, here everything's flat and green. It's pretty, but at that that was beautiful. I'd go back there in a heartbeat, man. What is that? I ninety that goes from Seattle to Boise. Um, I don't know. It was. I don't. I don't remember. I don't. All I remember is my daughter was a young child yeah. then, and she was apparently hungry, and we didn't know that was for some reason the trigger, and she literally screamed and was like having a mental patient in the car for like three fucking hours. And we all wanted to kill her. It was, and then we just stopped for food and it ended. And we like, how did we not know this? I guess, I don't know. Maybe we were tired, but um, that's all I remember about that drive. I, I, yeah. <laughs> and there's this place we stopped washing in, in Washington that with, I'm sure there's tons of places, this beautiful place on the side of the road, like, with fresh apples and fruit, man. It was just, it was like a Norman Rockwell yeah. book, man. It was just beautiful, man. I, I really love that place. And I wish I knew, it's kind of like, I guess if someone goes to New York, you really don't, if you don't know what you're doing, you kind of wander. And I wish I had some guidelines because I was sort of wandering around Seattle. And I'm like, man, this is the big hip city, but I'm sure I was just in the wrong places, you know? Yeah. yeah. Well, and that's just something that j- every, um, every tourist has <laughs> figured well, every, out. Every town is like, yeah. that. I mean, if you're, if you're staying off the interstate, you know what I mean? Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, Howard Johnson and all there is, is like fast food. It's like, you might not get the best idea. It's like, you have <laughs> yeah. to go into town and, yeah. and kind of go to, you know, my friend, my friend Soupy always used to say when they would get to a new town, they would ask somebody where the freaks hang out. There you so, go. Hey, where, do the, where do the freaks hang out? Yeah. That's, that, <laughs> like we were in town, but it was just like I'm, there was more to the place than what is it? Pike's Market or something like that? Yeah. Pike Place Market. Yeah. Pike yeah, Place. There's a, there's a real hipster area called Ballard that's, um, you know, was originally like a Scandinavian, like a Norwegian, like fishing town. Cool. You know, so, uh, you know historically, and it's been kind of gentrified. Yeah. In, place that now has like restaurants and and bars and coffee shops and yoga studios and things like that and so every every town will have that thing as well and then there'll be the real funky 
you know, part. And then there'll be the part where there's the college maybe, or maybe it's a college right, tent. Right. It's like, you just have to like kind of figure that out over the, over the, over the years of travel. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, that's a, that's pretty much accurate. Yoga is really big out in LA, right? Every Yeah. yeah. Yoga is big everywhere. You know what I mean? It's weird. It's like, I just, part of it is probably a bias, but I feel like so many towns that I go are, are trying to be more and more like LA. Is it? Yeah. In, in terms of the, of, of what there is to offer for, uh, entertainment, uh, you know, food and drink, certainly like exercise, like yoga or mm. hot yoga or whatever. I mean, it's, it's not just LA, it's, you know, Denver, yeah. you know, Austin, Nashville, it's, it's, it's everywhere. Yeah, you know that's what good, I mean? that's, you're right. Yeah, man. Sydney, Australia. You know what I mean? It's just like Sydney, Australia was so much like LA. You know what I mean? Or just or like uh, like New York, like LA, like San Francisco. It was so much like just like big the big yeah. city kind of feel to it. That's um, funny. It's funny how much the how little you know the differences from town to town as as the years go by seem to get wiped away. Yeah, yeah. The things become... there really there's only really now there's the city and there's the country. So, yeah, that's true. And and those are those are at least to me like because I travel a lot and it's like I I've really seen that over the last ten years kind of become the thing where it's like a lot of the towns have less of their own identity and just become a just become the city. Yeah, we well, got the strip malls and the same stores and the same restaurants and uh, it's just a mass yeah. of people. It's like yeah. and they need they need what they need. So right. There's, you know they got they got the place where all the the um, Chili's, you know, the, Starbucks, are, you know yeah, what I mean. Yeah. They got the mall where all the all the corporations are. They got like a trendy part of town where you can get coffee and do yoga, and they all have that. Yeah. And then you go out into the country, and the towns are much smaller. They don't have any of that stuff. You know, the people are kind of a little different, and yeah. that's kind of like the main kind of thing where those are kind of the two groups to yeah. me. City and country. And, that's, that sounds about more and more. Um, that, that just seems to codify more and more as I get older and travel more. It's like, I don't, there's not gigantic differences. You mentioned the Pacific Northwest. That was just, you know, between Seattle and Portland and Boise, there aren't, there aren't like huge differences between those towns. The mm -hmm. biggest differences with those towns are the size of the towns. Seattle's the biggest, Portland's the second biggest, Boise's the third biggest. Yeah. And it's like Boise gets, you know, continues to grow yeah. because of People who can't afford to live in Seattle and Portland, right. you know? yeah. So it's like, you know, and they'll and they'll just get to be like three towns that are real similar. Is know? is weed legal in I Idaho? Uh, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if it is in Idaho. I kind of doubt it. Yeah, Idaho, I kind of doubt it. <laughs> Idaho is a little more conservative. You yeah. know, the thing is, is you know, Oregon and Washington are are pretty conservative states. They just have two big liberal cities. Interesting. I didn't of, know that. A lot of the population is, but if you get out of the, that's kind of what I'm talking about with city and country. It's like, if you're in Oregon and you get out of the city of Portland, all of a sudden the hipsters are fucking gone really? and you are in, the, you are in like the country. Interesting. You know, people who work in like the logging industry or the import export, you know what I mean? They work yeah. on the, you know what I mean? Or they, Whether work they work for the government in the forest or something yeah. like that. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's like, and it's like those kinds of industries and agriculture and you, you are like in the country and people are conservative. Interesting. But yeah. there's, you know, it's like there aren't a lot of people out there. And so yeah. the people voting in the city of Portland kind of control the narrative a little bit. Okay. But, I get you. but it's pretty conservative. I mean, most of the states are conservative and then Idaho has always been a real conservative place. Anyway. Yeah, definitely. So it's, you know, less so, but it's the same thing where the city of Boise contains a lot of the population and the college, and that's you know Boise is blue. You yeah, know what I mean? for the most part. So it's just interesting. An interesting thing. Man, um, what kind of work did your folks do? Um, well, like I said, we moved around a little. My dad started; he's always worked in banks, um, and he was doing uh, just different kind of banking for a while. He did investment advising. Uh, help, you know, portfolio management. Um, and then the last like 10 or 15 years of his career, he was working with people's in the, uh, with people's trusts. So doing trust management, yeah. um, 
so, you know, he, we, you know, he and I obviously took real different, uh, you know, paths, you know, and, and whenever we're talking about the, the music business, it's filtered through his kind of old school, right kind of banking mentality where he's the kind of a guy who would have a lot of, you know, he would have, for instance, business cards hmm. and he would be, when he networked and would meet strangers, he would like hand them a business card. Right. And, uh, it worked, you know what I mean? And, right. Back in the um, day. Cause there was no internet. <laughs> and I was always, and I'm always trying to tell him, you know, it's like having like a, a typed resume, like for me would be useless. Right. And it's not something that I make fun of. It's not something that I take lightly. It's just, I mean, I'm telling you, it's like literally would not, yeah. it would probably do more harm than good. Yeah. If you handed like, someone a resume, yeah. Or a business card for that matter, where you're like, I'm a guitar player. Like I'm looking for work. Like here's my card. Call me. And it's like, that would probably turn people off. I don't know about that. You think oh, so? I mean, I don't, I don't know, but I don't I, know I don't, for sure. But I think so just because I feel like, in my business, the business of hi hiring guitar players to come be in your band, it's mostly recommendation based. Right, but if you met a guy, if you're out at a, at a checking out a band one night, you met a guy and you got along, and he said, "Hey, listen, you know what? I'd love to play with you sometime. Here's my card. Just give me a call if I could help you out with something." I probably wouldn't call that guy. Really. Yeah, I don't think that they would call. I mean, that's that's never. I I had business cards when yeah. I was younger. No one ever, no one ever called me from that. I mean, it's it really it's it's a, weird, it's a weird thing in entertainment, and I think this this might actually apply to other businesses as well. Which I, and I don't know because I've only really ever been in the one business. Yeah, sure. But but I think that. I think that uh, is a really weird kind of reverse psychology thing where it's like. You don't really want the guy who always really like wants to be in the in the band and is working real hard to be in the band. That's in some ways kind of a red flag. Yeah, you want the guy that's maybe you not available. That yeah, who's I, like available? Who's like so busy he can't even do it because he's so good or I like totally he, he seems like he's maybe like aloof or like he's not that like like that's the guy for some reason that you always want. And it's like yeah. this weird reverse psychology that I think apply that definitely goes across all areas of entertainment. Interesting. With, with so much of it is kind of recommend uh, recommendation based and word of mouth based because you know frankly there are a lot of gigs there are a lot of bands there are a lot of solo artists and you know someone recommending me for something uh, or someone recommending a musician to me for something carries a more weight than almost any other way. I, of, I totally get that. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I, I to that's I totally get that. It's kind of like uh, dating. You don't you know. The, you want to date the girl that's or or whatever some of you know, your flavor is. You want to date the girl that's a little hard to get, not the one that's like you know dying to go out with you and kind of you yeah. Know, yeah I, mean, that's, I, I totally that's, get it. That's a some that's like a that's an element of human nature yeah. that is mixed up with with business and marketing. Yeah, where it's like you just you. You want scarcity. It. It's called scarcity. <laughs> yeah, it's called scarcity, man. That's what you call it in marketing anyway. You always try to create some scarcity. Yeah. So that's what my dad and I kind of, you know, because my dad majored in economics and he knows enough about it that he, he has, he's taught econ at the college level and stuff like that. Oh my so, God. So he's that's... definitely, he's coming at it from that point of yeah. view and he's a really smart guy. And he's right about a lot of stuff. He just doesn't always understand some of these intangible things that are unique to entertainment. Right, right. Like, for instance, the, you know, just the idea of leave them wanting more. Leave them wanting more, right? Right, right. It's like restaurants don't think that way. No. You know, I mean, restaurants don't think leave, leave you wanting more. It's like, do you want an appetizer? Do you want like dessert? Like <laughs> they want you to eat until you're stuffed, right? Right. It's only kind of you know, entertainment just has these kind of certain little things that are unique to it. Yes. And, and I think that that certainly in terms of like hiring personnel, it's it's not quite the same as other job markets where you, you know, have an interview and you have a resume and you, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's like yeah. There are some similarities, but I mean, I had an interview with, with Dwight and, you know, I walked in. <laughs> if you had given him a business card, yeah, sure, uh, give him my resume. Dwight, you know? here, uh, just call me. Call my uh, have just, have you know, your I girl had, call had, my girl. Had, uh, <laughs> you know, I had a Beatles haircut when I walked in, and he looked at me and asked me if I liked the Beatles. 
And then that's what we talked about for like, you know, almost the entire hour that I was there was almost all just about the Beatles. That's so funny. And so it's really interesting because I think that, you know, I think, you know, he's a, he's a Beatles nut and, you know, I'm a Beatles nut and we both are into all of the minutia and details of, of, of the Beatles, you know, studio output. Mm. And so it's just kind of like, that was the interview. <laughs> And it's like trying to kind of explain that to an old school economist. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Was, uh, you know, it's just one of those things where you, know, you can't really argue with the results, but you know, you can't make any damn sense of it either. You know? No, no, no. It's vibe. If you're recommended because a player, <laughs> that, you know, you're qualified. The the issue is not qualifications in 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 music. It's how do you get along and how do you mesh and sure. are you going to do the work? That's because sure. you're, once you're recommended, that means you're qualified. No one's going to sure. recommend you if you suck. No, I mean, yeah. At the end of the interview, he goes, so he goes, I assume uh, he goes, you know, you play, you play keyboards. This gig is mostly keyboards. I go, yeah, I play keyboards. And he goes, okay. And he goes, and I assume you play guitar. And I go, yeah. Cause you know, everyone plays guitar. Yeah. And then he goes, and you sing, are you like a tenor? And I go, yeah, I'm a tenor. And he goes, okay. And he goes, how about pedal steel? And I go, I've never, never played a pedal steel and he goes, well, he goes he goes do you have any interest in doing that and i go yeah and he goes all right well that's it let's talk about the beatles you know what i mean <laughs> you should have said listen you're dwight yokum if you want me to play uh two matches <laughs> if you want me to play maracas i'll be the best fucking maraca player you'd ever find that's a paraphrase of pretty much what i said yeah, she was like, yeah. Do you want to play steel and it's just like for you you know whatever yeah. you want that's cool, yeah, man. Should, you know, you know, it's funny because I what I'm fun, laughing at inside about the business card thing is I've been working for myself since 1994 or 90, I think maybe even, and uh, 94, I think, yeah, and uh, I never had a business card, and I have business cards now because I'll a, after I interview someone, I'll I, I'll send them a little thank you note. And I just stick the business card. But it's a cool looking card. It's more like, you know, something you'd stick on a, you know, put a thumbtack into it because it's just cool looking, you know. And so I was yeah. laughing. I'm like, oh, my God, I have a business card now. And I give all these. Music. And people call me and say, hey, man, I love your card. So I'm thinking, OK, so I'm not a dick. So it must be OK. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, I can understand what you're saying. Well, and a lot, of, a lot of what I'm saying about that and just about a lot of this stuff, I mean, these are just my kind of opinions. I, I definitely don't like yeah. think that, that everything I'm saying is correct. No, you and know, I would I, guarantee I can you. I really wrong about so many of my, of my opinions. <laughs> no, know? I am sure you're right. And I guarantee you my only thoughts are because I worked in, and, and still am in the business world and I'm 55. So I have both cl- – I'm clouded by both. Mm-hmm. I got you. You know, my experience in, in the last almost two years doing all these interviews and then, you know, 30 years of, of, of working. So I can understand both sides, which is, I guess, a blessing and a curse. Right. Man, let's talk about uh, gear for a few minutes. Did oh, you, yeah. I, w- I was waiting for this. Tell me, We're what do you get into the gear? What are you playing now, like guitar wise? What's your number one? Okay. So this is pretty cool. Um, so when I was with. Uh, Dwight, the drummer in that band is a guy named Mitch Marine and Mitch produced Sugarland, that second record. He played all my gigs when, when we were in the band together because we had the same schedule, right? And he also... I've heard that guy's name before for some reason. Oh, Has he done a lot of production or something? Yeah. Yeah, he's produced uh, several records and he's played drums. I mean, he's, he's about your age. He's played drums his whole life. I mean, yeah. he's played smash mouth and he's he's been with dwight for that's, like 15 that's where, years that's why i heard his name associated i think smash mouth <laughs> yeah, lawrence cat i mean he's friends with lawrence that's Kat that's where then, I, yeah. yeah man lawrence mentioned him okay so uh you know anyway he plugged me in to a couple of a handful of artists that he was working with um and one of them is chris shiflett from the oh Food yeah Fire. sure and uh and i have become pretty good friends with Chris over the years. We've co-written songs and we've, I've done, we've done stuff on each other's records and different shows and stuff. And I'm, I'm actually working, uh, for him right now is, uh, he's, he's got an album coming out and he's doing a bunch of tour dates and Chris has a custom, uh, deluxe Telecaster. Mm that he's made with Fender and there's a couple different versions, but the, the mass marketed one is this Mexican made 
it's like it's like a gold sparkle uh, Telly Deluxe, and they're not, you know, I think they're maybe seven hundred bucks or something like that at Guitar Center. And Chris had Fender send me one, and I basically replaced all the electronics and put in a bone nut. You do all that yourself? I didn't do any of it. Okay, I don't okay. know, I don't know yeah. how to do any of that shit. Um, but I had all that done, and that is now my number one guitar. And so that has – I use uh, a lot of Lawler pickups. Mm. So that guitar has Lawler humbuckers, and they're like the um, – like low wind Yep. There's yep. like there's like three levels of whining that they do. Yeah. Uh, the low, the like retro, you know, vintage one, the regular kind of modern one, and then the high output ones. And so they're the lowest output ones. They're like vintage. Like Lawlers. Um, the bone nut makes a huge difference. What does um, that do? I, How does that make a difference? Sustain or tuning? Uh, it's uh no, it's just a brighter sound. You know, because, you know, the string is touching the guitar in like two places, right? It's touching it on the bridge and it's touching it on the nut. Yeah. And then, you know, to a lesser extent, the tuning pegs and the and the actual like hole in the back of the guitar. But really, the what in terms of the sound that you hear coming off of the string, it touches the guitar in two places. Hmm. So the materials that the nut is made out of and that the bridge are made out of are going to really affect the sound, right? So the plastic nut is just a little bit of a deader sound. Yeah. Like the, the bone nut is just, is like brighter and maybe a little more expressive. I mean, it's like a slight difference, but you know, it takes a, it takes a guitar, you know, that's a, sounds like a $500 guitar and makes it sound more like a thousand dollar guitar. Very, which is great. And it's like a really, you know, it's like a really small change. Um, but the most important thing about this guitar is that although it is a Telecaster, it does not have a Telecaster fretboard. So this guitar has like a rosewood fretboard and the radial circumference yeah. is flatter. Oh, so that's it's, great. It's more, like, it's more like the fretboard that would be on like an SG or, just thinking Fire, that, uh, yeah. or something like that, which is, you know, Chris's, I think one of Chris's favorite guitars is a Firebird. So that might be how they got it going. And I think as you get up above the 12th fret, it's even flatter across than it is, you know, the first seven frets. You know what I mean? I yep. think it's, I think it's like graded in some way. Um, and, and we haven't, we don't even know, I was talking to Chris about it. We don't even know exactly what's going on with this neck, but I'm in the process of just trying to get like two or three more. And Oh, you and like build, it that much? Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm going to build a B rig. So I'm going to do another, deluxe hmm. telly and put one of those necks on it and then i want to do a strat body with one of those necks on it as well oh that's cool man because it's really hard you know i have a i have like a you know a telly that's like a it's like a, a reissue of like the 52 style so it's a maple neck with yep. the old school like and it's like kind of hard to play after playing this one for the, like, yeah i mean i played it for like a year and then you know, it's out with the Chris rig. And so I'm like, okay, now I, now I don't have anything to play in town. So I go get my old guitars out and I don't want to play any of them. <laughs> uh, the only one that I still want to play is my, you know, my first, the oldest guitar that I have is an 80s Japanese Strat that has a uh, rosewood neck and a, uh, a rosewood fretboard rather. And a, um, it has single space uh, Seymour Duncan pickups. So there's like a hot rail in the bridge and a JB junior in the middle. And I don't even know what the neck is. I don't ever use it. So, uh, that guitar is, was my number one for a really long time. And it's a great guitar. And that's the one, if you ever see pictures of me playing this, it's a white strat with a painting on it. Mm. That's that guitar. The Japanese Strat. So you're Chris. And that's, great, and that's a great guitar. I just don't want to travel with it anymore because it's one of a kind. It has. It's like it's just a really nice guitar, and it has this one of a kind painting on it. And um, I just wouldn't want anything to happen to that. Sure. I've had it I've had it almost twenty years. Um, it's a great guitar. It's pretty unique, and uh, you know, so I don't travel with that one anymore. But I've been using the Shifla one a lot, and I'm in the process of building a B version of that guitar. So it's cool. gonna be that one's gonna be black um with Lawler. I'm getting the middle grade wind on this one. Oh, not the low. 
I'm not going to I'm going to do the next one up and just see see how it sounds. And mm. I, if I if it's something I don't like, I'm, I might go back to the low one. The low wines sound really good. Yeah, I prefer lower. Humbuckers, but you can play like jangle shit where it sounds like a, a Rickenbacker or something like that. Like they're really sensitive and like glassy. They're nice, really nice pickups. That's cool, but man. Stephen Swan, uh, so I'll give him a shout out here. He's the buyer at Austin Vintage Guitars, which is the which is like the main store in Austin mm. for for gear. Uh, and he recommended Lawler pickups to me, and now I have like three guitars with Lawlers in them. Two, I have two tell or three tellies, and one of them has humbuckers, and the other two have single coil. But they're really cool pickups. So I've been using a lot of those, um, and that that Shiflet guitar is fucking really cool. So this this other one I'm going to build is like I have to. It takes a lot of work because I have to get the neck somehow, either separately or buy another Shiflet one, and then. Uh, to have Chris Shiflet make the call to make your life a lot easier. <laughs> yeah. No, send funny, send me know. three necks. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, I, uh, with Chris, yeah, I definitely, I gotta, I like to like pick my battles, you know what I mean? Yeah. Because I don't want him just making all every, you know, making all the calls for me. He's got a, he's got enough on his kind of plate. Um, but I think it's going to be cool. I'm getting like a black relic body, uh, black pick guard, rosewood fretboard, and then it's going to be all the hardware is going to be like uh, nickel. That's cool, man. You know, you know what? So- when I, well, I like relic guitars. When I first came, uh, when I first saw them, I was like, "Oh, this is bullshit." Then I see they look great, man. They, yeah, they look, look they look really cool. And it's just like one of those things where I, I have you know you can it's just like doing it the easy way or the hard. You can buy it like that, or you know my white my white telly was bought off the floor brand new with not a mark on it. And now it now it has all kinds of stuff. Same thing with the white strap. Right. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah, but you know, if you don't have twenty, you know, if you can't go back in time twenty years and relic up your guitar, and the problem is, you know, I think everybody would say, "Hey, I'd rather have an original," but you can't fucking afford a oh, vintage yeah. guitar, you know. But you well, can and get. Even if I could, I, I wouldn't take it. Uh, I wouldn't take yeah. it. Yeah. Do a club tour, you know what I mean? It's like absolutely. You, you really have to have like a full time tech to like guard the shit. Yeah, totally. And even then, it gets hot. It gets cold. It gets knocked around. There's so much stuff that can go wrong. It's like. I basically only really want to tour with guitars now where if the guitar just vanished, I could, you know, in 30 days, I could buy the parts and assemble another one. And it'd be pretty similar, you know. Man, I totally get that. So number one is the Shiflet. Number two is a Japanese Strat. Is there like a number three? Uh, Not really. That's what I have right now. The number three is going to be this B1 that I'm building. Um, and then, you know, I have a couple of Squire, um, the classic vibe series. Yeah, I, have yeah. two, I have two or three of those. I really like them because I just. Tellies or strats? Cause I have a buddy of mine. He, he has a telly. He's nuts about it. He loves it. Yeah. I have two of the tellies. I have the white, it's white and with a black pick guard. That's like a 52, um, reissue and then i have another one that's like a 59 or 60 reissue so it's got it's like a tobacco burst with like mm. white binding. Uh, so i have those two and those are both uh, it's the same thing where all the electronics have been replaced lawler pickups and uh, bone nuts and they the white one also has i stripped all the lacquer off the deck oh. so now it's like a custom shop or like a nash yeah i was kind of trying to think of like a nash telling uh, and so that guitar is pretty cool, but like I say, it's like it's kind of uncomfortable to play. Like after playing this like shiftlet neck, yeah. It's like I don't know if I ever really want. I don't really want to play maple necks anymore. That's kind of part of it. I really want to kind of stick with rosewood. You, you, you and mean cool. fret fret boards? You mean correct? Yeah, yeah. Cause I feel the same way. I, I have one. I'm, I got to sell it. I have a telly. It's like never even been played. It was my experiment. It's maple. I can't. I got to get rid of it. I cannot. You know. It's all. Yeah. I just don't like. I'm like. I like the it, tactile. It feels better. Ebony rosewood. It just feels. I like that a lot better. I'm with you, man. Right. Do you remember uh, first CD you ever purchased, or was it record for you? It might have been a CD. Well, for me, it was tapes. Oh, right, uh, cassette tapes. As I recall, and when and then um, you know CDs were a little later, but the, the first stuff I had was all on tape, and it was. Um, it would have been like a Buddy Holly greatest hits. There was one called Buddy Holly Lives that was a greatest hits. And I had um, 
I had an Elvis uh, RCA collection on tape mm-hmm. and a uh, Eddie Cochran. Oh, wow. So you're a 50s guy. Yeah. You know, my, my, and that's kind of my dad, you know, my, my dad kind of, um, you know, he remembered a lot of that stuff from his own kind of youth. Mm. Banker by day. Yeah. Elvis rocker uh, by night. Was, you know, he was, uh, you know, he was a teenager from like 59 to 65 mm. or something like that. Sure, so it was sure. a really good time to be, to be a teenager. Yeah. Music. And yeah. so, you know, my, my parents had the Beatles, the stones, Bob Dylan, the beach boys, and that was kind of their vinyl collection. A lot of stuff like that from that, you know, credence and, and things like that. And I saw a couple of movies when I was real young, like six, you know, five, six years old. I saw, uh, the La Bamba, Mm, yeah, Bounce yeah, movie, Richie Bounce, sure. which is interestingly enough, you know, it's Los Lobos doing all the music. Yeah on the soundtrack and then the uh, buddy Holly story with Gary Busey and the music in that movie is actually Gary Busey and the other two actors, uh, playing the, the songs live on, on camera. Yeah. That was a big thing years ago. But, uh, you know, just the, this material was so great. I fell in love with it. And so my dad was like, Oh, okay, well we'll go get you these, these tapes, you know? So, so the first thing I had was about a half dozen tapes of like all the fifties got, you know, little Richard and Chuck Berry and Elvis, uh, Jerry Lee Lewis, Eddie Cochran, like I was saying, like all those fifties guys. And so that was the beginning for me. And that's always been my first love. That's cool, uh, man. Really into like a lot of other, um, music obviously. Um, but I, I keep going back to that and that, that stuff for me has a lot of power and, uh, so that's the first thing I had. Probably Buddy Holly lives on cassette tape. Desert Island Discs, man. Give me your top ones. No particular order. Just for today, like, so knee-jerk reaction. Um, let's see. Desert Island Discs. Uh, what should we do here? Um, well, I friggin' love Bob Dylan. Interesting. Well, okay. It's really hard to pick a certain a certain one. I've really gotten a lot out of his bootleg archival series. Supposedly now, he has more, a larger bootleg collection. I heard this years ago, that there's more bootleg Bob Dylan stuff than any other artist in the history of music. Yeah, it would make sense. Well, mm-hmm. and this is stuff, I mean, he and Neil Young both have their official archival releases. Mm. So it's like the, the bootleg market has had this stuff for probably a long time. But their releases are like mastered really well, and they sound oh, like really Pearl well. Jams or or Government sure. Mule. I mean, God, that right. stuff is pristine. So they have so there's one, uh, you know, the the bootleg series has I don't know a dozen volumes, but volume eight is called Telltale Signs, and it's a it's a bunch of outtakes from the era of like eighty eight to ninety four or something like that. So there's a bunch of the really cool Jack Frost type stuff. I got to do uh, at least one Tom Petty. So uh, how about Long After Dark by Tom Petty? Uh, I really like um, – there's this Neil Young album I've been listening to over the years a lot. It's um, Yeah, it's, it's a great album. It's, it's part of his uh, archive mm-hmm. series. So it's Crazy Horse, Neil Young with Crazy Horse. Fillmore East in 1970. I have that record. It's great. Really great sounding record. And I I have all of his archival stuff too, but this is my favorite. Uh, Uh, Oh, uh, Chuck Berry, the great 28. That's like uh, of all of the 50s stuff. That's my favorite. I mean, 28 Chuck Berry songs on one CD that would have to go. And uh, I don't know, get something kind of weird in there. What do we got? I don't even know. Oh, how about, oh, you know what I really like? Really, just do Velvet Underground, the third record. Good band. Velvet Underground, Velvet Underground. I grew up in New York City, like I said, so they, they were very popular there, obviously. Yeah. I and I can really go on and on and on. I mean, there's just so much... Uh, you know, stuff that I've kind of gotten, gotten into and then gotten out of and come, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's, it's, when you I, hear something, 
was like in my twenties, I listened to that to the band Wilco all the time. You know, you know who I have coming on this afternoon, Nels. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I just I just actually finished uh, the Jeff Tweedy book. How was that? Uh, good. Came out. Yeah, it was good. Cool. I just it was one of those things where like. And there was a time in my life where I listened to so I listened to that band so much, and now it's like I don't. But the, that's, that's but like, normal. That's totally the Chuck normal. Chuck Berry album is like it always sounds good to me. You know what I'm saying? Like that would be a good one for a desert island because there there aren't really too many days that go by where that one doesn't sound good to me. You know what I mean? Dude, it's really weird. I can't tell you how many times I'm like talking to somebody and they mention an artist they love, and I either just got off with that individual they're coming on or the next day they're coming on. It's really weird. I don't know why that yeah. happens. It's really strange. Um, man, Brian, what are the most important things you've learned about yourself throughout all this and uh, through life in general? Uh, well, you know, it's funny. We kind of alluded to it earlier. Um, when we were talking about, you know, like, like you don't, you might not know, you might not be able to like trust your gut, you know what I'm saying? In certain situations or whatever. So, you know, one thing that's just really important for me is to not always speak when I feel like speaking, you know what I mean? To like hold off and think about it and try to have a different perspective and, and basically try to skew it more uh, to a more positive direction yeah. before I open up my mouth and speak. <laughs> You know, that's that's just something where over the years it's um, it's been a problem for me, probably my biggest problem. You know what I mean? Because I, you know, I feel like musically I'm like good enough to hang, but I've definitely hurt myself uh, on certain gigs just by opening my mouth and, and just sharing some opinion that no one <laughs> wanted to hear. Right. Basically. Uh, and, and, you know, and, in a, and usually in a, like a negative kind of light. So that's a really big thing for me that I just kind of certainly I have a long way to go, but that is something that I kind of work on. And it's like in terms of like what I've learned, it's just that um, I'll put it to you this way. The session that I was doing with Rick Allen that I was telling you about, there were like some really fucking heavy guys on this session. Doug Pettibone was playing guitar. You oh, probably yeah. talked to him. I know he is. Yeah. Bob Glaub was the bass player. Yeah. He's, you know, he's like played on my favorite Warren Zevon records. Yeah, and Linda been around Stan, a long time. This stuff. Um, you know, the producer is Jim Scott, who's amazing. He worked on Wildflowers. You know, Steve Ferroni uh, from the Heartbreakers is playing drums. So everyone there is like super fucking heavy. And the drummer, from, you know, Rick Allen from Def Leppard is kind of like overseeing it. You know, his wife, Lauren Monroe, is the artist. Everyone there is like at the top – like top tier for like what they do. And the thing that I noticed is that everyone was just ridiculously positive. I mean, everyone is professional, but everyone is really positive. It's like you walk over to Bob Glaub and go, man, you sound so great. And he goes, you sound great, man. And it's like, he doesn't have any reason to like right. say that, you know, it's like, it's just you know, easier, man. I'm telling yeah, you. And I just, I just noticed that everyone was, was like really positive and really nice and really generous, you know, with their spirits and with their compliments and with their time. And it was, um, you know, it just occurred to me as I was driving home from that, that first day that it was really no accident that all those really, really nice guys are also at the top of their field and the first guy on the list that you call, you know what I mean? Yes. And so that was like, that was just something that I really kind of took to heart from that. And it's something that, you know, I've been, I've been working at it a long time, but I really was like, you know, I really got to get, I got to get there because I think that, I think that you can naturally be that way. And maybe some of those guys are, sure, but I, but I think it also takes work. I think it, I think it takes effort. If you're not uh, naturally that way. Yeah, of course. Yeah, it does. Right. Well, I think even if you are naturally, it's like you might not always feel like that at the first thing in the morning when you get to the session and you're unloading your stuff. Like you might not feel like being nice to guys you don't know. I mean, you know what I'm saying? But like they do it. You know what I mean? Like they really do it. And like it was just really it was just really impressive. You know, that's good, something, man. something I really took from that, you know, and I'm telling you, it's a lot less work. Right? <laughs> I'm telling you, that's why I did. It. I'm like, wow, this is uh it's just way too much work being a dick. I'm going to be nice. And it was like that simple. I'm like, wow. And uh, it, it, um, 
it's just it much less stressful, man. And and your vibe is then therefore much more well received by others. It's right. it's definitely noticeable, man. Um, are you a rule breaker or rule follower? What's your nature? Uh, mostly a rule breaker. Yeah. Uh, I would say, you know, and I'm, uh, it's, uh, it's one of those things where if I am, uh, if I'm working for someone else, it's, uh, you have to be a little less obvious about breaking the rules. Of course. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But some people, and of course, Dwight is the main example I would use here, but a lot of the people that I've worked for, that's kind of what they want. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's yeah, like they want independent. There's certain, things, there's certain things that they're, that they want you to do and there's no kind of leeway, but they also kind of, they want someone who's a little freer and who's not going to be, uh, you know, not going to be afraid to take a chance. And so in terms of just the, um, the kind of rules for being a, uh, you know, a singer songwriter, or a you know band leader in 2019 in the music business as it currently is, I am a big time rule breaker, and I I strongly dislike a lot of the ways that it that it goes and that people work and the kind of process that you go through as you're trying to break your own kind of career and stuff. There's a lot of things that people will advise you to do that I don't really want to do, um, and so in that sense, it's like. I would rather be a lot less famous and do do things my way. Sure, and I that's think, something I think a lot of that's something like that's that. kind of become really clear to me in the last four or five years, and it probably has always been there. But you know, I, I kind of um, I kind of have the the you know what I really care about is is good singers and good songs, you know, and people that have those kinds of talents. And, you know, a, a good instrumentalist, too. You know, it's like that's kind of what I appreciate. I think good singers and good songwriters are harder to find than good instrumentalists. Um, but that's what I care about. That's the thing that I really care about in, in the music business. And the way um, stuff is kind of marketed is something that's not really very important to me. Sure. Now, I, know you, I know you're in marketing, so that's, I don't want that's, to. That, you're not offending me. <laughs> I mean, no. But I'm, but I'm saying I know that. At all. And I know that it's hey, the way of, the way things are marketed offend me. Sure, to, to be honest you know, with you, it's it even the way it's marketed because I, I think that like marketing basically is like a skill that I don't really have, right. and I have a lot of appreciation for. What I dislike is there are a lot of people in the music business who are more talented marketers than they are artists. I totally get that, man. Uh, and so that's kind of that's kind of the thing where that's those are the rules that I like to break. Because I call bullshit on all that stuff, and you know, I stop short of putting people on blast because I just don't want to like be that guy. But that's something that's like really important to me, where um, you know the actual abilities. And I think that you know, if you're selling tickets and selling records, you know, more power to you because I don't know if the audience always cares about it the way I do. Yeah, you know what I mean. Uh, so, and that's fine. But just like for for me personally, you know, that's that's what's important is actual artistic talent and someone who really has something to say. Um, and you know, I, I was talking with Chris the other day. I, I really think, I think that there are, um, you know, there are a lot of people who are talented artists on this side. And then there's a lot of people over on this other side who are really, really good at marketing and branding and things like that. Sure. And I think that the people who are really good at both of those things is a really short list that includes people like Bob Dylan and Paul McCartney and Dave Grohl and, you know, people who were really good at both. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, they're two separate skill sets. It's, it would be a very rare overlap. Yeah. And it'd be, they, good, and they, like, it'd be like guys who are good accountants and uh, good at uh, roofing. Well, you sure. And not only are they different you know? skills, kind of at odds with one another. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? And so I just think that that's why the people who are good at it, I mean, you know, Paul McCartney is a good marketer and a great artist. Mick yeah. Jagger, hmm. great marketer, great artist. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so that's those are the kinds of guys who are on that list. I don't know too many people like at my level who are really good at both. Yeah, they're not, pretty, they're, yeah pretty they're not many. Fun. Hey, um, 
Who's had the biggest influence on you musically and also personally? Uh, huh. You know, um, it's interesting. Musically, I would say uh, it's a pretty tough question to ask because there's a lot of people, but I would probably give that to Buddy Holly. Interesting. I think that Buddy Holly was a rule breaker. I think that he was a pop songwriter. Um, you know, I think that he was not necessarily interested in uh, being labeled. You know what I mean? I think he wanted to make his music and do it the way he wanted to do it. And it's like, if if you were around now, they'd, he'd be one of those guys where they're saying it's too country for rock and too rock for country or something like that. So that's someone that I relate to a lot musically. Um, you know, and that's always, that's always been, uh, you know, he's always been there, you know, he was kind of the first thing. And so he's always kind of been there. And, you know, and the, and the other one, the other really big one is Tom Petty, uh, Tom Petty, you know, when he passed away, I was just, I was kind of asking myself like why I was so sad that this person had died that I'd never met. Um, and, you know, I think the reason, part of the reason why is that, you know, he was uh, kind of like a, a light that you could kind of follow as an artist because, you know, his choices were his own, basically, as, yeah. he, as he created his art and built his career uh, over the decades. His choices were all his own, and he was willing to go to the mat and fight for stuff that he thought was important. And he would fight with anybody. He would, it wasn't just his label, you know what I mean? Or, you know, his people like on the business side. I mean, it was like his own band. If his own band disagreed with him, he did, he just never really bent to any of that. And the cool thing is that he was right. You know what I mean? It's like his own band didn't want to play on the song Free Fall. You know what I mean? His label didn't want to release the the song free fall you know what i'm saying yeah. like every, everyone that was around him when he was making that record with jeff lynn was like what are you doing you're crazy and it turned out to be this like massive like world dominating hit record yeah. five or six amazing timeless songs so you know he was right and uh that's just one of those things where you know when i'm feeling uh you know when i'm feeling doubts in myself or when people are kind of telling me they think i need to do this or that to help my brand or this you know it's like i always kind of think about tom petty uh and it's cool, a guiding kind of light you know what i mean you know and i think that those you know especially with tom petty i think that veers over into the into the personal realm but you know Honestly, it's like the people who have been influenced me personally, they, they don't always play music. You know, my wife, Rachel, is an amazing person and has changed the way I see the world. You know, both my parents did a great job raising me to be a, a semi-decent and semi-functional kind of <laughs> member of society. You know, I worked for a long time on and off for a singer-songwriter named Mike Stinson, who is just this lovely guy and was the very beginning of me realizing that, you know, being a talented guy was not going to be enough. You also have to be a good person and you have to be nice to people. And I would watch the way this guy would go from town to town and just make people just fall in love with him. You know what I mean? Uh, with his, with his way, not just his talent, but with just the way he was. Yeah. Um, and so those kinds of, you know, those kinds of things, you know, I mentioned my friend, uh, Steven who works at the guitar store in Austin. I mean, he and I have been friends for a decade and, and, you know, he's influenced me too. You know, it's like, I think we've probably influenced each other. We've, we've watched ourselves go through career stuff and both of us got, you know, getting married and everything. And just, I mean, that's kind of like what I look to in terms of trying to be a better person. How long have you been married? I'm actually, you know, it's funny. I'm, I'm engaged. I'm getting married in uh, the beginning of next year. Oh, congratulations, so, man. We've been together for four years. We've been together six months. So I've, I've just started. Wait a minute. You've been, you've been together six months. You've been living together four years. 
we've been together for six years. Oh, okay. Been, yeah, yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Almost that whole time. That's a long time. Yeah, it's a long time. Well, how come you get married if you don't mind me asking? You old like tradition? Look, no one gets married now. Uh, what What was the question? Like, what? What? I'm surprised you're getting married. No, I don't know anybody who's getting married anymore. Oh, I mean, well, we we talked. We've been talking about it for a little while, and um. You know, we both wanted to do it, and I was just kind of waiting because it's just it's like I don't know what I'm waiting. You're waiting for there to be like more money or some kind of a break, and <laughs> yeah, realized that none of that was ever going to happen. And, you know, I uh, I just wanted it to be. I wanted it to be for real. I wanted it to be official. She's a great woman. Congratulations, you know, she's, man. She's she's, uh, she's uh, really you know she's really into music. She could, she could have been, if she works in the music publishing industry, you know, she would have been a great old school A&R person. Hmm. She really knows that she's not a, she's not a musician, you know, um, she just really knows, uh, she knows how to find a hit basically. That's like cool, she knows man. As a hit. Like she listens to a lot of music for a job and she'll come home and play me these songs. And it's like, you really know like what makes a hit which is really interesting to me. She, she has a really good sensibility to that, which is one of my favorite qualities, but you know, just watching her, uh, it's just, it's just been a, it's been a really amazing journey with her the last six years. Good for uh, you, man. Just watching her start her career. You know, when I met her, she was, you know, when I met her, she'd been sober for like, for like one year and she was, going through a career change. She'd come out to LA to be an actor, hmm. decided she didn't want to do that and was getting into music on the publishing and licensing side. And so I watched her go from having an unpaid internship to a paid internship, to a part-time job, to a full-time job, to a full-time job with benefits and everything. And That's I just cool, watched, man. make this, make this journey. And it's one of the coolest things I've ever seen. And it just, and just when I, when I talk about, you know, someone who influences me personally, she's the first person I think of because she just did it all. She did this all on her own. She was like, I don't want to be an actor anymore. I want to do something else. And she just had to get on the phone and start calling people and, and put herself in these kind of uncomfortable situations where you have to, you're just starting over and you have to make it based on what you have in your, in your head, in your back pocket. You know yeah. what I mean? And so I watched her do that and it's just one of the coolest things, you know, that just kind of, it gives you, it gives you hope. You know what I mean? Man, well, I wish you guys a lot of luck. That's really good. Congratulations, man. Um, one more question and I appreciate all your time, Brian. Oh, yeah, it's no problem. What's been the uh, biggest change in your personality over the last five years and how much of that has been intentional and how much is a natural part of aging? Yeah, well, I know that's how I that's how I would answer that question is just going from 32 to 37, which is the last five years. Uh, you know, it definitely it, it definitely this this decade has been really different from my 20s in terms of how much I kind of look out uh, as opposed to looking in. I feel like and this is probably pretty normal, but I think that when I was in my 20s, I was, I had my head firmly up my own ass yeah, uh, at almost all times I'm with you on that. <laughs> and so still, and I still deal with that, but I mean, I've just gotten a little better at looking out, uh, putting myself in the other guy's shoes, trying to kind of think before I speak, um, things like that. Uh, that's, that's really been, uh, that's really been the big change. And I think a lot of that just, just comes with, um, like you say, kind of getting older, but you know, it's, uh, it's still kind of a long way from kind of what I want to be and getting into the, you know, trying to be, a, trying to be more like a Zen Buddhist about, to, about <laughs> life is, is a life's, is, is a life's work. You know yeah, what I mean? It's not easy. It, does, it isn't something that you just, that I was able anyway to just wake up and do, um, but that would be, um, you know, I would say another thing is uh, really trying to just kind of pick my moments, kind of pick my battles. Um, you know, it's really easy to let the kind of day to day of doing what I do for a living uh, to give things too much weight and think about them too much and internalize them, take them personally or whatever. 
Um, and really trying to not do that has been, uh, at least I hope, what has kind of defined the last uh, five years for me. And part of it is I think what naturally happens as you get older, you know what I mean? I think you run out of energy. Like you say, you know, it takes more energy to be nice than to be an asshole. It's like you just run out of energy. No, the other way, other way around, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it takes more energy to be an asshole. You run out of energy uh, for worry. You yeah. know what I mean? It, you know, it's like a, like a lot of people I dealt with dealt with a lot of anxiety. And it's like it takes a lot of work to have anxiety. It takes yeah. a lot of energy. Uh, and so that's something that I feel like I just really kind of uh, grapple with you know, day to day. And, you know, the last five years is important here because it's like before that I wasn't even aware of what was happening mm. in, in my mind. And so, I mean, it's just like happening. It feels like it's like happening to someone else. And then you start to get a little older and realize that you can actually control it. Yeah. Uh, you could write your, whatever ending you want. That's the right. cool thing. And so that's really, you know, that's really uh, kind of, where I'm at in terms of, you know, in terms of the music and the career, it's like, I don't, I don't even know with music. I feel like I'm kind of, I really just want to do what I want to do and the career will, will follow. And so what I worry about more is just the kind of stuff that we're just talking about where I'm just trying to be a better guy. You know what I mean? Just trying to be a better person after kind of, you know, I, I feel like I've been pretty lucky in the music business, you know, but like, but personally, there's always, it's always been uh, tricky, you know what I mean? And it's like, took a while to even figure out what was going on, like why, you know, things I would say and do would, would like cause the results that they did, you know what I mean? It's like, it just takes a long time to like, for me anyway, it took a while to, to kind of figure that out. And, and so that's, you know, maybe it's cause I'm kind of getting married or, you know, some of these kind of personal changes are happening, but that's like, that's really what I've been thinking about a lot recently. It's a way more than, than, uh, than music, you know, it's like, I feel like I've been really lucky. LA has been really good to me. Um, and I get, you know, the phone rings and I get work and I feel like I'm in the right kind of place as far as that goes. Um, but you know, personally, it's like, I feel like it takes, it takes work, you know, to be the person you want to be. And so that's kind of where I'm, I feel like I'm kind of knee deep in that, waist deep in that right now, you know? Well, man, first of all, I think you're doing all the right things and I'm really happy for you that uh, you're headed where you want to go. And uh, I really, you've been really cool with uh, being so open, man. And I really appreciate that. And I think a lot of people are going to vibe with you on a, a lot of the things you said. Um, and I wish you nothing but luck first of all get married cuz that ain't easy and um well it's not so it's, it's work man it's it's work it's not bad work it's good work but you got to do the work yeah. man like that's what i've found anyway you know yeah i think i like that way of putting it though i mean it's good work and like i say you know i've been living with rage for a long time here mm. and so i have some idea of the kind of good work that goes into yeah, it yeah i mean it's no surprises but i mean this guy told me one time cuz i didn't have good role models for that and he said hey uh your marriage is like your business. If you stop working it, it stops working. I was like, man, that I can, you know, that was broken down really simple for my silly little mind to understand. And I always kept that in mind. Didn't always do the best job of it, but I always kept it in mind, you know? So, right. but, uh, so good luck with that. Um, I look forward to your record coming out, man. And let me tell people where to find you. It's uh, Brian Whelan and it's W H E L A. Do I pronounce your last name right? It's Whelan. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Brian Whelan, W H E L A N, and his website is Brian Whelan Music.com. His uh, last two records, uh, Decider and Sugarland, are both on his website, and they're on iTunes, Spotify, and Amazon as well. And you can hit him up on Facebook or Instagram. Again, it's Brian Whelan, and he's doing a lot of gigs out and around LA. So check out his social media pages, and you can definitely find him there. Go to his website. That's the uh, central conduit for everything, please. It's brianwhelanmusic.com. Any uh, final words, man? Just thanks for having me. It's been a great talking with you, Jay. Oh, you're welcome, man. Appreciate this in-depth interview. You really <laughs> you're welcome, man. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for coming on the show. And like I said, I look forward to your next record. 
Everybody, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this, please share it with a friend on social media. We appreciate your support. Thanks again to Brian Whelan for spending time with us. Please support Brian and his music at brianwhelanmusic.com. And make sure you go to everyonelovesguitar.com. Sign up to get on our newsletter list so you and I can connect. And most important, remember that happiness is a choice. So choose wisely. Be nice, go play your guitar, and have fun. Till next time, peace and love, everybody. I'm out. We hope you enjoyed this show. If you did, subscribe to the Everyone Loves Guitar podcast, and you can do this online at everyonelovesguitar.com or on iTunes. And if you like the show, please leave us a five-star positive review. The more five-star reviews we get, the higher our show ranks, and higher rankings mean we get to continue speaking with cool, interesting guests on our show. We'll see you on the next episode, and until then, keep playing your guitar and have fun making music. Thank you.